Yay! Um, this is video two of chapter two. So the first one, it was like, hey, your computer's running low. Time to plug it. And then it died. So as soon as it told me it was running low, it died, um, which means it thankfully didn't delete the recording that I had, but it just stopped it. Um, so this is video two, picking up on slide 28, the predator prey. Um, the last thing I just meant was saying is the prey or predator population does not grow immediately when a, um, when a prey population does. It does take time for them to like have that environmental stimulus that, oh, well, there's more food around, so we can, you know, we're not competing, we're not starving, we're not hungry, we have more energy to dispose of, like, we're able to reproduce. Um, I think additionally with that, you know, if organisms move to a new place, they don't just move there and they're like, whoa, let's reproduce. No, they need to have time to, like, establish themselves to um, find a food source, to find a habitat, to find a place where they can hide. So there is like a lag time. It does take time for them to figure out um, how to live in that area. Okay, um, so chemosynthesis. Chemosynthesis is just, it's similar to photosynthesis, except it's you, they use um, chemicals. The chemosynthetic bacteria use chemicals. And their job is to convert inorganic material into organic material so that their energy source for this process is hydrogen sulfide h2s very similar to the sun is the energy source for photosynthesis so symbiotic bacteria right it's chemosynthetic bacteria it has a symbiotic relationship with the tube worms will convert hydrogen sulfide um, into organic material into carbohydrates just like a plant can and then if something ingests that, they will get organic material or carbohydrates or food that will allow them to survive. Um, answering with the word food is really vague. Oh, no. Here come all the yawns. Um, and just saying energy there, I'll just let you know, I'm going to tell, tell you a million times in class, but you can't just say energy because there's so many different forms of energy. Is it kinetic energy? Is it potential energy? Is it gravitational potential energy? Is it solar energy? Is it chemical energy in the form of food? Um, so we have to be specific. What if you want to say in, like, in terms of trophic levels, the producer gives the consumer energy, you would want to say organic material or chemical energy because it is a chemical that we are ingesting that we are converting into energy. So we just we need to be um, thinking about it's not just energy, what kind of energy. Um, hydrogen sulfide, and you could spell that with an S as well. Is the primary energy source for um, hydrothermal vents. What is a shoal? So we say school, but in this class we're going to say shoal. Um, it's a large number of the of fish that are approximately the same species and about the same size. It doesn't even um, have to be about the same age because you could be, you know, twenty year old um, marlin with a thirty year old marlin, or you know, a ten year old marlin, whatever. They're going to be very similar in size but um, maybe their ages could be different. It's about their size. Smaller organisms, smaller fish cannot shoal with the larger of their species. They will cannibalize each other. They cannot be overlapping in each other's habitats or niches. The smaller juveniles, they don't need parental care. They do their own thing. They, they go wherever they need to go. The adults, um, like the sexually mature ones, they are going to be somewhere else. Otherwise, they will compete. <clears throat> and then... Um, one, they'll die. One will have to die or one will have to move, like go somewhere else. So it's the same species. You know, you don't have um, hammerheads and great whites shoaling together. So about the same species and approximately the same size. Um, we refer to it as a school when it's a group of fish that meet together in a coordinated way. Um, but we're going to call this a shoal. Benefits. Definitely have to know these. These are easy questions. Um, hydrodynamic efficiency. Every year people say aerodynamic efficiency. That's when you're in the air. Hydrodynamics when you're swimming in the water. So the benefit of being in a large group is you don't have to exert so much energy to swim because you are in that current that's being made from your shoal. If they're all swimming, you know, to the left, you're just going to get pulled that way. You don't really have to put a ton of effort into doing it. So they save energy by swimming together. It's 
um, more like hydro efficient for them, um, hydrodynamically efficient for them. They just don't have to expend as much energy. Predator avoidance, two ways. Um, one is referred to on your test as the confusion effect. So when there's so many, it's hard to just pick out one. It's hard to focus on one. Um, so they could form even, it's called, um, the shoals can form a bait ball and just, um, just kind of stay in this really dense ball together. Fish have what's called a lateral line down their sides. And that's how they can react to water movement so fast. You know, you just like touch the water, they're gone. And they follow each other really fast. I know you've seen it before and you're like, dang, those things are moving really fast. Um, they have like a, they can feel electrical currents on the side of their body. It's called the lateral line and they can feel like the water moving. They can feel electrical currents changing in the water. So th that's how they're all able to swim together. Um, and that happens when there's, you know, a, a dolphin's going to try and swim through the shoal. They will all divert from each other. Now, dolphins um, and whales can combat this by flicking their tail. If they flick their tail behind them, they are going to like knock some out and then just swim by and eat them. Um, the many eyes, you're going to be able to say many eyes for a couple things, but um, with many eyes, they are able to see their predators, you know, like safety in numbers. They're able to look out and see when the predator's coming. Foraging advantages. Um, if you're foraging, that means you're looking for food. Foraging means looking for food. So again, with the many eyes, it is easier to spot a food source when you have so many looking for you. So that's another benefit of being in a shoal. The time for finding food goes down. Reproductive advantage. You have, and now listen to this one, listen to this one. People get this wrong all the time because of the way they say it. This does not guarantee that you will mate. This does not guarantee that you will have offspring. No way. Just because you're in a group of other humans, there is no mating guarantee. There is no fertilization offspring guarantee just because you're around them. However, being in a big group allows you to find a potential mate. Use the word potential. Use the word potential. There's no guarantee that you're going to find the fish of your dreams in your shoal. There's no guarantee for that. You can't speak like that. You can't speak in absolutes. Um, there's no guarantee that they will actually become fertile and reproduce. There's, you can't, so you can't say um, it has reproductive advantages because it allows them to fertilize easier. Nobody said that. It allows them to find potential mates easier. And it increases the chance of fertilization. It increases the chance of fertilization. The way f majority of fish reproduce, the female will lay their eggs. Now, depending on what kind of fish they are, for example, salmon lay their eggs in a gravel bed. They dig out a hole. It's called a red, R-E-D-D. -D. Um, depending on what kind of organism, what kind of fish you are, you'll have different mating um, strategies. Anyways. Most likely these fish are going to, when they get to their actual habitat, um, they're going to release their eggs. And then they usually like have a really thick mucus coating around them. Almost like, think of like if you had a big loogie and a bunch of little fish eggs inside of it. It's going to stay within the loogie. The loogie is pretty um, hydrophobic. And then they might like attach it to something, um, you know, to a little leaf or the stem of a seaweed. The males of that species will come over and broadcast spawn, which means they're going to just like release sperm on them. Now, there is no guarantee that things will be fertile, fertilized, but there is an increased chance of fertilization. So watch the way that you word this because it's an easy question to get right. And with a couple wrong words, it's an easy question to get wrong. So the reproductive advantages, um, there is an increased chance to find mates. You have an increased chance of um, getting the eggs fertilized because there's so many. Okay, so again, examples. Um, sardines, when they're threatened, they form bait balls. Could be hundreds of thousands of them in one. You can see them most, most of the time from a satellite, and it looks like an oil slick, and it's not. It's just a lot of fish. Skipjack tuna can form shoals up to 50,000. Two different types of shoalers. <clears throat> Um, before you, you know, like 
put this too much in your brain. I've never seen a question that talked about obligate and facultative shoulders. I include it because it's in your textbook. I've never come across a question about it. So don't work so hard to commit this to memory. Now, like watch me jinx myself and you know, you end up having to learn it. An obligate shoulder is gonna spend all of their time shoaling. Um, when they're separated from their shoal, they may become agitated. So like tuna and herring will do this. Um, it's like they're obligated, like an obligate shoulder. They're obligated to shoal with each other. Facultative is only some of the time. It's like for a purpose. They're going to be shoaling. Um, could be for reproductive purposes or for foraging purposes. Um, succession examples is the same as it was in biology. Okay. Um, there's two main parts to this, and sometimes this is a two-mark question. Let me just look in your study guide really quick and see. Okay, if we're looking at number 30, it's, um, right here. it's learning outcome F. F is a succession, um, like, content you have to know. It says on page 9, explain the meaning of the following terms. So you need a definition. And then give one example from the marine environment. So the definition is going to be the change in a community structure over time. And that's where the word succeed comes from. If you're going to succeed from something, you're going to, oh, don't die, don't die, don't die, sorry. If you are going to succeed from something, you are going to be um, in a, like a gradual changing process over time. So if you're going to like succeed from the union or um, you know succeed and graduate high school, and you're in this changing process over time. In terms of ecology, this is going to be how like a how a community or um, the living things better themselves over time. So um, this was just a terrestrial example. This is not one that you will be allowed to use because it will not help you. It's not a marine example. But in a new environment, you'll just have some really small like shrubs and annual plants. Um, lichen, L-I-C-H-E-N, -E lichen is always a pioneer species. It's a combination of um, fungus and algae. It's like the white crust you might find on barks of trees. Um, but over time, you can see that this has really built itself up. So at the end is what we would call like a climax community. It's where it's like just maxing itself out, um, has all of its niches filled. It is at carrying capacity. So there's enough species there for the resources that they have. That's succession. Um, there's two different kinds. Primary succession will be like the worst case scenario. There is no remnants of the previous community left over. Um, this doesn't happen often. So a volcano would do this. And having that magma solidifying, you have brand new rock, nothing living is there. You have no fertile soil, no microorganisms in the soil, nothing is alive, brand new. That would be um, an example of succession. Um, a bomb killing everything that's alive. Again, like you're starting off with a clean slate, nothing's left over. So no, no, like even the microorganisms, the microscopics that are in soil, that would make something secondary succession if they were left over. Primary succession has none of that. Um, when glaciers start to like retreat and move and they scrape across like continental boundaries, they expose new rock. There's no organisms there. So that's a brand new um, succession. Um, pioneer species, like I said, are the first organisms to colonize the new area. Lichen is the most common. Lichen can break down the rock that is formed when you have volcanoes and magma solidifying. Um, break it down to like smaller minerals so that other plants can get there, which is essentially where we're going to get soil from. Everything that is solid ground, even sand, like has to have originated from volcanoes. Um, all right, secondary succession. So your communities are not completely um, clean slated. They're not completely starting over. So this could be like a forest fire, deforestation. You still have remnants of the previous community. You still have some of those left over. Secondary succession is not as bad. Um, hurricanes, floods, desertification, over farming, over grazing of animals illegal logging, which is deforestation, fires, um, you still have remnants of your previous ecosystem left there. Uh, and in terms of like 
the speed of succession, obviously secondary succession will like become a climax community faster because it already has some existing organisms still there. And a hydrothermal vent. And I mentioned this in the previous lecture. Um, the first species to inhabit there is called Tevnia. Tevnia is a type of tube worm. You can see it in this picture here, but this is actually Riftia. Riftia is two meters long. So I have that meter stick, it's big. Um, they're big. And they can grow that big because hydrothermal vents don't have like competition of, of organisms living there. They can grow. Um, but the first organism to inhabit the new hydrothermal vent community is going to be Tevnia. And it's a type of tube worm. So if you're your succession example, you could talk about succession at hydrothermal vents, starting with Tevnia. And then the um, that's the pioneer species. The next species to come in to take its place and make it more of like a climax community is going to be Riftia. Riftia is larger. Riftia grows faster. So T and then R. Okay. Tevnia is usually white. But this clump of worm is stained brown from the iron, the iron that's in hemoglobin. Um, the largest worm in this clump with the more white color is a different species. It's Riftia. This one's Riftia. And the outside of their shell, again, is called chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N. Okay. If we look at this cross-section, so here's the whole organism. If we look inside here, and then specifically inside this, this little capillary area. Yes. Oh, cool. Is this happening? I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. I'm zooming in. Can you see that? Maybe you can. I don't know. Um, here's your little chemosynthetic bacteria. They perform chemosynthesis, and they synthesize organic materials. Um, they're going to get the sulfide and the carbon dioxide from diffusion out of their bloodstream. And once they are able to create organic material and then they release oxygen in the process, it can go into the bloodstream, back into the bloodstream of the tube worm. So now the tube worm is getting nutrients and the tube worm is also getting oxygen. So it can do respiration. What is happening? Another example is the whale fall. So when a whale dies, its carcass will sink to the sea floor. It's known as a whale fall. Um, check out the video, these two videos um, below. I know you saw a couple, in, one in class, but check out the videos below. That'll help you understand it more, help you answer these questions correctly. Um, the video shows the gradual change in the community over time. And again, community is all of your different populations together. The term community is all the biotic, all of the living things together. When you then go to the word ecosystem, it adds in the abiotic, the temperature, the salinity, um, the depth, the pressure, cloud cover, um, nutrient availability. All of that is a abiotic component. I got another one, number 35. It says, using specific examples from the environment, explain the meaning of each of the following terms. And succession is three marks. So I know you have the two mark definition, a gradual change in a community structure over time, over time. You need the time to add that second mark. And then an example, it could be the whale fall or it could be succession at the hydrothermal vent, Tevnia going to Riftia. Um, again, 43 and 44, same thing. What is meant by the term succession? A change in a community structure over time. There's your two marks. And then outline. So outline means like um, a listing, like a procedure, only sticking to specifics. One example of succession in the marine environment. Three marks. And I don't know that I have more succession questions. That's pretty much that's pretty much all the succession is. Um, say the definition, give an example. Say the definition, give an example. Um, okay, 
I know, let's see if I can't move these. Just so you can read it. I don't know why it came like that. Okay, to the bottom. I think we're almost done. Okay, extreme and unstable environments. Um, so let's move these over. Extreme and unstable environments are going to have low biodiversity. There's not going to be a lot of organisms that can live, A, in an environment that's extreme and that's unstable. And I'm going to just move this so I can read it to you. Now, um, extreme is going to mean like, does it have extreme temperatures, either hot or cold? A hydrothermal vent does. Um, does it have extreme pressures? A hydrothermal vent does. Extremely high pressure, all the way down to the ocean. Sorry. Um, does it lack sunlight completely, completely aphotic, no sun? Hydrothermal vent does. Um, does it have acid there? Is the water there a little bit acidic? Hydrothermal vent is. Um, so those things are extreme. It's hard to live in extreme environments, but the organisms that can, can. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones. Temperature, pressure, depth. Lack of sunlight, um, it's really acidic, so it has a low pH. All those would make something very extreme. And if they're unstable, that means that they change frequently. They change frequently, frequently. So like maybe twice a day if it's a diurnal tide. Um, you know, you got your high and then your low. The high and then the low. It happens twice a day. So sometimes they are exposed to air and sunlight and possible desiccation and evaporation. Other times they are exposed to, they're under the water, they're submerged. Um, that is unstable. It is not extreme. Our shoreline is unstable. On a sandy shoreline, it is unstable. The sand can dry out. Um, the wind can blow it away. The water can blow it away. And it, so it doesn't stay the same. It can easily be eroded. It could easily be moved, easily. So it, it is unstable. You can't have, you don't see like plants setting up shop right where the waves come in. They can't, they can't, they can't sit there. They have nothing to anchor into. It gets eroded so easily. So that is unstable, but it is not extreme. The temperatures are not extreme. It's not acidic. Um, there is, it, there's sunlight. So it's not completely, you know, black. It's, there's sunlight. Um, the depth, it's not deep. Um, the pressure, there is a normal amount of air pressure. So it's not like it's too much pressure and we're going to implode on ourselves. So that is, is the difference between extreme and unstable. Um, a hydrothermal vent, very extreme, very stable. A hydrothermal vent is a hard place to live all the time. It doesn't change. It never changes. It is cold at the bottom of the ocean all the time. It is extremely hot coming out of the vent all the time. It is always gonna be a little bit acidic there all the time. It is always gonna be dark. The pressure is always gonna be high all the time. So um, that those are things that are extreme, but they're always extreme. So they are stable. It's very stable what the ecosystem's like. And what this reads, it says example one, sand easily dries out and easily eroded by wind and water. Um, example two, hydrothermal vents have high pressure, high temperature. High temperature is right at the vent. Remember, it's right at the vent. Um, anywhere around it is going to be very cold temperature. And very few organisms can be adapted to live there. Why it doesn't have a high biodiversity? Because um, it's hard to live there. If you, if you can't do it, you can't do it. Our shoreline. The sandy shore, very low biodiversity. 
it's hard to live there. You have to be a burrower or a very fast moving um, bird. Okay. Um, okay. Stable and um, favorable environments, non-extreme, will have really high biodiversity. So coral reef is always a nice place to live. It is always going to be like warm. It's always going to have a good amount of sunlight. Um, you're not going to have this like huge flux of nutrients. It's not acidic. The salinity is pretty stable. Um, this, it's just, it's always going to be a nice place to live. Always. It's not too deep. So the pressure isn't too high. It's nice. And it's always like that. So it's stable. And then organisms are, you know, there's a lot of organisms that can adapt to living in a very easy place to live. The only thing with this is because the biodiversity is so high, we need to be very specific on what each organism does. We don't want them to start overlapping on each other. If you have 5,000 organisms living there and you only have exactly 5,000 niches, you eat this, you live here, this is what you do. This is what you excrete, this is what you take in. If you have 5,000 organisms and 5,000 niches, each organism must follow, or rather each species must follow their specific instructions. It's very narrow. Narrow means thin. Here's wide, here's narrow. Very narrow, very narrow. You can only eat A. You can only live in habitat B. You can only mate with habit with organism C. Um, that that is a very specified niche. You do not want them. Oh well, I was going to go do this today and eat that. So maybe no, 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 no. You do the same. It, it can't overlap. It can't overlap. There are so many organisms. It has to be in <clears throat> like very ordered. They cannot start doing each other's jobs. What will happen then is interspecies competition you know so two clownfish are like whoa dude you can't be doing my job that's my job what are you doing um and i say job because i know that's kind of how you apply like the word niche but i, I should be saying role I should be saying role um they cannot be overlapping each other's roles they can't otherwise one organism is either gonna have to die or leave if two teachers were in here me and somebody else and we're both trying to talk to you guys and, and talk over each other I'm either gonna have to get rid of other teacher or they're gonna or I'm gonna have to leave or that other teacher is gonna have to leave. But there will be competition between us because you can't have two people doing the same job, two organisms doing the same job. That's gonna cause a lot of competition. So having very narrow niches is going to um, stop competition. Okay. So a narrow niche, this is for an organism that can only live in very like narrow parameters. They have to have a specific habitat. They eat specific food sources. They have to live in specific conditions. And by conditions, I mean temperature, pressure, salinity, pH, depth, all of those. Very narrow range of food requirements. They cannot eat many things. An example of this would be the butterfly fish. They're very territorial because that is their habitat. That is their place. If something starts taking over, they're going to have competition. They live really closely with corals and anemones. Um, it, they're very specific. And if another fish starts doing their job, there will be fighting. Either one will have to die or one will have to leave. And that's the competitive exclusion principle from regular bio that no two species can occupy the same niche in the same place at the same time or else they will compete. One will have to leave or one will have to die. Your generalized niche this is very general. It's not very, it's very broad. It's open. Um, a wide niche even. They can have wide niches. Same thing as generalized or, or wide. It's not narrow. It's not very specific. The generalized niche um, is going to be for organisms that can exploit. This is the definition. It is like a role held by organisms that can exploit a wide range of food, 
habitats, and it's not listed here, but it is, and conditions. I'm telling you right now, the condition needs to be the third one. So they can exploit a wide range of food. Think about a shark. They are not, they are not picky. They'll eat anything. And it's not like somebody's coming over and they're like, whoa, 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 that was mine. They don't live in places that are very biodiverse. They are like the top predators. They can live wherever they want. So generalized niches, they can eat a lot of food. So exploit a wide range of food, a wide range of habitats and conditions. Sharks can live where um, there's a lot of sunlight, a little bit of sunlight. They can, they come to our inner tidal zone. Literally people get bitten on the leg all the time. They can swim in the middle of the ocean. Um, they can dive deep. They can live where it's cold. They can live where it's warm. We have sharks in the river. So that means that they can be in an estuary, an area where you have fresh water and salt water mixing. So they can live in different salinities. They can exploit a wide range of food, habitat, and conditions. Um, tuna are similar as well. So this is that last question that was on your um, study guide. And before I even go to that one, the, one of the fish on the front, which is number 32, it says butterfly fish are examples of organisms that occupy a specialized niche. Some marine organisms occupy general niches. Using a named example, explain what is meant by the term general ecological niche. So you need an example of one that actually works. I would go, I would go shark, hammerhead, great white, I don't care. Um, and we need to say it's an organism that can exploit or take advantage of a wide range of habitats, food, and um, conditions. So why do they have very, very narrow ecological niches, places with high biodiversity, with a lot of um, organisms? Because each species will have to have its own niche within the ecosystem. A niche is an organism's role in the ecosystem. And that mark is typically given whenever you give the definition. If the niche is overlapped, there would be competition. Competition between what? Competition between resources, food, um, shelter, habitat, mates. <clears throat> so having narrow niches, having each organism doing their own thing will reduce that overlap and therefore reduce competition. And you don't have to have an organism dying or an organism having to emigrate out. Okay, um, great. Watch this over. You don't have to rewrite your notes or anything, but if I said anything that made more sense, then totally add that in.